Dead on Your Feet, Arthur Grant Michaels, St. Martin's Press, New York, 1993. Stan Krejcik Mystery, Book 3, Narrator Eric Ost. In memory of Tajana and Andre, with gratitude and respect and love, thanks to the patience and generosity of my friends. Chapter 3 Dinner at 8. Max Harkey lived atop a four story brownstone called the Appleton. The building had been gutted and lavishly refitted during the golden days of the Boston Housing Authority, when slum property was proclaimed historic landmark willy nilly, then mindlessly purged of its history to be rezoned, rebuilt, and reassessed. This one time historic treasure now boasted an architectural disfigurement. A glass walled penthouse erected upon the original roof. That anachronistic superstructure was Max Harkey's place, which seemed an appropriate home for the controversial director of the Boston City Ballet. Lesser mortals occupied the original four levels of the building, though my interior designer friends claim that every flat in the Appleton is a decorator's dream. The building lies within two convenient blocks of the Boston Center for the Arts on a narrow cul-de-sac dubbed Appleton Muse, a reference to the numerous converted carriage houses that line the street. The location also puts it within a few blocks of Station D headquarters of the Boston Police Department. It was almost 8 o'clock when I arrived there, fashionably on time. I noticed Big Red parked on the sidewalk outside the building and felt a twinge around my left nipple. Strange what a symbol of love can do. I entered the foyer and pressed the button for number five. Within seconds, a voice with a slight and pleasant accent came over the intercom. Who's there, please? Stan Krejcik. There was a long pause before he asked, Your name again, please? Stan Krejcik. I'm with Rafik... Punisian? After another pause, the buzzer sounded and I went in. I hoped I wouldn't need a passport and visa to get into the penthouse. I found the lobby elevator, which was a small cubicle paneled in bird's eye maple. Once inside, I pressed the button marked PH, which obviously stood for penthouse. Yet the label didn't seem right for a fifth floor apartment that had been stuck onto the roof of an old brownstone. 45th floor, maybe, but I live on a fifth floor and I sure don't consider my place a penthouse. The elevator door closed with a fluid whoosh, and the tiny cha chamber slid upward noiselessly. Without any mechanical sound or vibration, the manufacturer's name engraved on a brass plate above the panel. A buttons explained the odd lack of noise. The elevator had been built by Hydrolift Limited of Liverpool, England, and must have worked by hydraulics instead of motors and pulleys and cables. The elevator came to a smooth stop and bobbed for just a second until the pressurized fluid stopped moving, kind of like a waterbed. The door slid open onto a vestibule from which wafted the scents of dried spice and wool carpeting. Atop a black lacquered console set a large vase of wintry cherry and three long branches of eucalyptus. Also on the console was a copper and glass art deco lamp. They gave a soft pinkish glow to the small area. I saw my reflection in a large mirror framed in vertigris finished wood, and I felt rich. The door to Max Harkey's apartment swung open and discharged all the noises and jabber of a party in progress. A small, sturdy framed young man with tawny skin and bold green blue eyes stood in the open doorway and greeted me. You were Stan? He said. I nodded. I could tell he'd paid a lot to have his blonde hair waved and colored, and the look suited him. He said, I am Rico. His accent was a gossamer and appealing. Please come in, he said like a question. Where are you from? I asked. Brazil. I entered Max Harkey's apartment and was engulfed by a world of visual art. Covering most of the wall facing me in the large foyer was a panel by David Hockney. One of the famous swimming pools, Rico beckoned me toward the drawing room where the other guests were gathered. On the way, I passed a small alcove that showcased two pieces, a pair of Roman warriors cast in bronze, each figure about two feet high. The men were poised for battle with their 
plumed helmets and unsheathed weapons, but they could have been ready for sex too, with their strongly arched backs and their muscular buttocks tense and exposed. I continued into the drawing room, despite the people talking and drinking and chatting energetically, and there my attention was taken by a gigantic Bussendorfer piano, shiny black and as long as a mobile home. It sat regally, surrounded by freestanding sculpture, the most notable of which was a large piece in rosewood, a stylized danseur, noble and aloof, perhaps inspired by Max Harkey in his youth. A vague memory from a college art course brought the name Ivan Mestrovic to mind, perhaps because the sculptor was a fellow Slav? Then my eyes wandered to the huge Morris Lewis canvas that occupied the far wall. Max Harkey's place was a goddamn museum, and the guests didn't even seem to notice. A striking man in his early forties with a square, angled face and a leonine mane of silver hair approached me. The cleft in his chin looked so matinee idle that I wondered if it was natural. The skin around his jaw and throat was still taut against the muscles and bones beneath. His pale blue eyes stared into mine with a cold, almost threatening gaze. You must be Stan, he said and extended his hand. I am Max Harkley. I shook his hand and replied, Thank you for inviting me. In high time, he said. I know Rafik so well I should meet his other half. He portrayed the gracious host perfectly, complete with a pleat sincerity. He led me to the wet bar where Rico had already resumed mixing drinks. That young thing certainly moved fast. I ordered a martini, and while Rico set it up, one of the other guests came over. Max Harkey introduced him as Marshall Xander, a longtime friend, and the major benefactor of the Boston City Ballet. Marshall Xander looked about the same age as Max Harkey, but with thinning brown hair that would be mostly gone before it ever became a distinguished gray. His body seemed lumbering and awkward, unused to any kind of movement. Clearly, he had never danced. Though his clothes were obviously expensive, they were dowdy and fit him badly. He was like a big, sloppy dog. One that had a fancy pedigree, but lacked any grace. What brings you here? he asked, which seemed an odd question to ask a guest. Perhaps he didn't know that I was coupled with Rafik. Or perhaps he didn't care, or perhaps it was just his clumsy attempt at friendliness. I'm with Rafik, I replied. Ah, he said without interest, and then turned his attention to Rico, who at that moment was placing my martini in front of me. He gestured for me to take the drink, which I did. Then I sipped it. It was perfect, super dry, and with a twist. Max Harkey then took me to meet Madame Rabinskia, who might already seen that morning at the ballet studios. Madame was ensconced in a capricious easy chair, upholstered in velvety azure mohair. She'd positioned her legs to show off the calves and ankles of, and feet, which were exquisite despite her age. She alternated between smoking and a long cigarette in an ivory holder and sipping what looked like sweet vermouth poured over ice. When Max Harkey introduced me, the old woman forced a smile. Of course, she said, pronouncing her R in two syllables. She offered me her hand while she fixed her eyes somewhere beyond my face. We have met before. I took her hand, not sure whether I should kiss it, shake it, or simply hold it. It was strangely firm and beautiful, strong too, without the slightest bump of arthritis. Her nails had been meticulously enameled with a muted red polish, and the pale crescent moons peeked out near the cuticles. Her face, however, was another matter. Madame had applied a chaotic array of makeup for the occasion, presumably her evening look. One intended to impart a sense of continental glamour, but which instead made her look like a porcelain doll that had survived a blitzkrieg. It was hardly an improvement on the stark mask she had worn earlier that day, and in a weak moment of aesthetic compassion, I almost offered her a free makeup session at Snips. But I quickly realized my folly and said nothing. I gave her a hand, a friendly squeezed, and released it finally. She placed it back on the arm of the chair, and I caught her ever so slightly, wiping her palm against the soft, nappy fabric. Perhaps it was a nervous reflex, or perhaps she felt contaminated? 
Just then I felt a familiar warm arm snake itself around my waist, and I knew that Rafik was near me. I turned and looked directly into his handsome face. What luck to love him. Hi, I said. Finally you have come, he said. I was worried. So he did think about me. Choosing my outfit took longer than I thought, I said. I glanced quickly around the room and noted that all the guests except Marshal Zanger and myself was wearing black. Sure, there were startling jags of color among the accessories, but the basic color scream tonight was, as I had predicted, black on black. Hanging on to Rafik's other arm was Tony Denatau, the conductor whom I had also met at the ballet studios earlier that day. Even Tony's color's choice proved to, that she belonged properly to this group. She wore a long-sleeved gray silk blouse and a formal evening skirt of black wool crepe. Her concession to color was the silk scarf of very graded bright blues and purples that she knotted loosely around the collar of her blouse. Good to see you again, she said with practiced geniality. It is obvious that she was using her high Brit that night. Tony Di Natal gave a theatrical toss to her head full of lush red hair. The gesture was already too familiar to me, like an irritating tick. She probably did it a lot when conducting from the podium or the headboard. I wondered if her friendliness with me was just a ploy to improve her chances with Rafik. It wouldn't be the first time one spouse had been charmed to clear a pathway to the other. Nice scarf, I retorted with the same mock familiarity, though the scarf was truly gorgeous. She smiled broadly at me, then pulled Rafik away with her toward the wall of glass windows that lined one side of the room. Rafik winked back at me. See you later, he said as Tony led him away. Left in their wake, I answered softly. I'm counting on it. I recalled his promise to spend the night in celebration of our anniversary already passed. I wasn't looking hopeful. Max Harkley reappeared and murmured to me. Fine young man. I know, I said. I wondered if Tony Di Natale's flirtation with my lover was bothering me because she represented the kind of woman I might have been had I been a woman. One's own obnoxious flaws seen in others can often provoke irrational dislike for them. Among the remaining guests were two dancers from the ballet class. I'd watched that morning the two who'd stood at the same bar with Rafik. One, the young man whose body resembled the most ideal incarnation of mine, and the other, the blonde ballerina who had continued her stretches while the other dancers left the studio. Tonight, they stood together apparently inseparable. They were drinking what looked like plain mineral water. I asked Max Harkey about them. The boy is Scott Malloy, he said, and the girl Elisa Cortland. I knew the terms boy and girl were often used throughout the dance world without disparagement, but coming from Max Harkey, they still sounded pejorative. I've seen them both on stage, I said, but I didn't even recognize them. Performance often brings our out aspects of the personality not evident in ballet, class, or ordinary society, replied Max Harkley. By the end of the evening, you may know more about them than you care to. He made a small laugh. I've seated you between them at dinner. Then he added almost to himself, interesting how much Scott Malloy resembles you in basic body type. I thought, except for my love handles, you mean? Sometimes I wonder if I should just lose the weight actualize myself as it were and open a 12-step weight loss clinic suddenly with we all heard the rich sonorities of the great piano filling the large reception room the one remaining guest i hadn't formally met had seated himself at the massive bossendorfer and had launched into a dazzling piece of music that energized the air like a musical aperitif jason spears whispered max hartley brilliant talent recently arrived from London with Mastra de Natal. He hopes to gain entree to Boston's concert scene. The pianist was a surprise to me. When I'd first seen him among the other guests, I assumed he was a model, who'd been invited as a kind of decoration. So super-groomed were his looks and demeanor that Jason Sears was also a virtuoso, seemed redundant. His fingers flew over the keyboard, nearly igniting it with a tour de force, that urged climax upon musical climax. 
The piece was so anabishly romantic that I found myself almost lighthearted from its sentimentality. Yet there was something about the shameless passion of the music that connected to me deeply, something I wanted to believe in and yell to, but was too embarrassed to admit. I watched Rafik and saw that he too was enthralled with the music, responding physically to every sound. Next to him, Tony Di Natal listened with the analytical detachment of a judge or a piano competition. Meanwhile, Marshall Zander leaned against the wet bar, smoking his cigarette and gulping his liquor. His vacuous face seemed impervious to the wild rush of notes, and my first impression of him changed. I saw that he resembled an evolved primate, more than a canine. He might even be related to those big brutes, the Kong family. Elsewhere, Scott Malloy and Elisa Cortland stood side by side, still drinking mineral water and whispering to each other, unaffected by Jason's Sears' fiery performance. Then I noticed that Madame Rabinskaya had vanished from the room, as had Rico, the houseboy. That young man sure moved fast. Then again, so had the old woman. Five minutes and several thousand notes later, Jason Sears finished the piece with a grand flourish of crashing chords. He let the final sounds ring through the air for several long seconds before damping the strings into silence. It took most of us a few moments to recover from it all. Then we burst into applause that lasted almost as long as the brief piece itself had. When all the enthusiasm and the congratulatory comments had subsided, Rico, the houseboy, reappeared and announced that dinner was served. Jason Sears approached Max Harkey and excused himself from dinner because he had an early flight the next morning. Besides, he said, I have horrible jet lag. Max Harkley replied, It certainly didn't show in your playing. That's just good technique, said the pianist. He bade goodbye to the group of us and then made a personal farewell to Tony Di Natale, who was still hanging on to Rafik's arm. I'll see you at the hotel later, he said to her while eyeing Rafik dubiously. I wondered what else did the dashing young lion excel at. I half expected to hear about his prowess at deferential equations. Then s there seemed only one more superlative left to this paragon, and I couldn't keep my eyes from wandering to that region of his anatomy, where looked the most superficial measure of a man, but the drape of his pleated trousers concealed all. Tony Di Natale said to him, Get some rest, Jason. Then she added, as if to counteract her obvious coolness. The list went well tonight. Thanks, he said, but his smirk showed more irritation than gratitude. Then he departed quickly. The rest of the us filed into the dining room. The table was a monolith of oiled mahogany that rested on six massive square legs, tins of flames from two elaborate candelabras washed the room in warm light and caused the place settings of porcelain silver and crystal to glitter and softly and give a welcome feeling to the room. Someone had raided the vault at Tiffany and Company. We took our seats, according to the place markers, hand-lettered cards edged with a Florentine strip of marbled green and gold leaf. Max Harkey sat at one end and Madame Rabinskaya at the other. Along one side, Starting at Max Harkey's end was Marshall Sander, then Tony Di Natale, then Rafik. At Madame's end on the other side were Elisa Cortland, then me, and finally Scott Malloy. Also near Madame Rabinskaya, Scott Malloy quietly asked me to change places with him so that he and Elisa Cortland could sit together, but I was certain that Max Harkey had choreographed his table seating with the same care he used when positioning his dancers on stage. So I replied to Scott Malloy, I'm fine, thank you. Max Harkey overheard the surreptitious exchange and asked, Is there a problem? For an awkward moment, neither Scott Malloy nor I could answer. Then I said, Not at all. And I took my seat. Scott Malloy sat down too, but he turned his body slightly away from me so that he angled more toward Madame Rabinskaya. Max Harkey made a small frown at the slight disturbance, but said nothing more about it. The meal began at last. Rico served us, and his talent in vanishing and reappearing by magic was tested to its limits. With the eight guests, the first course was a cold soup, creamy pink and sweet and sour all at once. I commented on it, 
partly to ease my social discomfort, partly to compliment Max Hartley's cuisine. It's delicious, I said. It's only borscht, said Madame Lebenskaya, with a small shrudge as if to emphasize the inanity of my remark. Muslin de blushed, corrected Max Hartley, with a quick wink to Madame. Muslin, repeated Madame, with the tiniest smile and nod back to Max Hartley. It's her own recipe, said Max Hartley, addressing everyone. Top secret, too. Suddenly, everyone else at the table was making suitable complimentary sounds about Madame's excellent soup. I watched Rafik and Tony Di Natal, but put down their spoons and applaud Madame and smile openly at each other. Their movements harmonized with the same natural ease that happens between siblings or lovers. On either side of me, Scott Malloy and Elisa Cortland imitated their actions precisely and joined in the applause. Meanwhile, Madame Rabinskaya accepted everyone's praise with austere cordiality. My original and sincere, if simple, comment had been blown out of proportion and I felt like a bumpkin. Once we all resumed our discreet sippings and scoopings of the cool pink concoction, Marshal Xander said suddenly, So what do you do, Stan? His words came out a bit too loud and with an obvious effort to keep them from slurring from all the liquor he'd had. But he did succeed in returning everyone's attention back toward me. I waited until every spoon was still was suspense before delivering my answer. I burn hair. You what? said Marshal Xander. I'm a hairstylist, I answered, on Newberry Street. Rafik interjected. He is very good. Tony Di Natal gave Rafik a playful nudge with her shoulder. I'm sure he is, she said. Then she asked me with her broad, fake British accent. Mine is the devil to get right. Would you do something for some time? Once again, she gave her wavy red tresses that well-practiced shake. I was already tired of Tony Di Natal. And would you do mine, too, added Elisa Cortland, blatantly, blatantly mimicking Tony Di Natal's accent du jour. And mine, added Marshal Xander with a glazed, mooning stare. And leave mine alone, said Scott Malau with a scowl. I'll be glad to do you all, I said. Some of them tittered politely at the double entendre, but the topic of my career was summarily dropped. As was any further inclusion of me in the conversation, the talk switched quickly to the gospel of the dance world, about which I knew little and for which I cared even less. The only other person who didn't join in the conversation was Marshal Xander, who was gapping at me from across the table and who was now quenching his thirst with Max Harkey's fine wine. I certainly didn't want to encourage him with friendly chatter, so I sat quietly and listened and observed everybody else. The talk focused on dance activity in New York, of which Boston was apparently a mere province. It was all about dancers and recent performances who were doing what, with whom, both on stage and off, who was really good and who was a fake, but despite the clever remarks. The words generally rang empty, as though the guests were all playing pre-recorded tapes for each other, showing off their verbal periettes. Throughout the sophisticated banner, I watched their faces, which seemed to tell more than their words. Tony Di Natal was obviously smitten with Rafik, who was in the thick of the dance talk. I saw her being entranced by Rafik's mouth and the shape it made when he spoke. I knew exactly what she was thinking, too. How those lips might taste and feel and the things they might do. I found myself gazing at my lover's mouth and then at Tony Di Natal's infatuation with it. When I finally looked elsewhere around the table, I caught Max Harkey and Elisa Cortland exchanging unlikely glances that betrayed desire and submission on both their parts. Then to my horror, I caught Marshal Xander study me with the same intent. Our eyes met and locked for a moment, and I thought, No! Just then, Rico entered the dining room, carrying a Venetian glass charger in his strong young arms. Upon the large platter sat an edible dome of molded fillets of meat of encrusted and succulent. It was surrounded by sparrettes of asparagus, car caramelized onions, and braised endive. All was arranged on a bed of broad, flat noodles. A narrow wedge of the meaty dome had been cut away and laid flat to show the stuffing of pate and pistachio nuts. Max Harkey said, 
We must thank Madame for sharing another treasure with us. Escalopes devout Rabininsky. Madame Rabinskaya replied, The Tsar's cook makes this for my grandmother. She was the Tsar's favorite ballerina. Brava, brava, said Marshal Sander, and he applauded loudly. Everyone at the table joined him. Then Marshall stood up, still applauding, and gestured for the rest of us to do the same. But we kept our places, wanting simply to eat and not to continue with the theatrical event. The dinner had become. When the applause stopped, Madame Rabinskaya added wryly, You should instead give ovation to Rico. He goes all morning to find veal, then he does everything exactly how I say. No question, I think maybe he will make a good dancer too. She laughed lightly at her own joke. Rico smiled in gratitude with the consul, where he was slicing the veal and filling her pla our plates. The meal proceeded in a grand manner with the additional courses, including a buttery gratin of sliced artichokes and duck cells, a sorbet, and a salad. The wines were French and Californian, all were of excellent vintages, and all played a major role in the culinary event. Far beyond that of a simple beverage, or so we were told, but despite the refined airs and the extraordinary food and wine and the fabulous surroundings, I really wasn't enjoying myself especially since I had to watch Tony de Natal and Rafik sitting together across from me. Their whispered exchanges seemed rude enough, but the real test came in trying to ignore Tony's sex-laden smirk when she passed Rafik the boat of creamy dill dressing. Oh, milky white and viscous and suggestive. Rico had and the houseboy offered me the only moment of comic relief by flirting in a direct and playful way that reminded me of a brief romance I'd had with a young Balinese. It had been a simpler kind of love than the one I now shared with Rafik, who at one point noticed Rico lingering over my shoulder long after a plate had been set properly in front of me. Rafik said, I think Raki Rico likes Stan. To his simple taunt, I replied too quickly and too loudly before my higher self could edit and censor my words. What do you care? I said. Everyone was instantly silent, eager to witness a private quarrel in public. Excuse me, Rafik asked as though he had misunderstood me. You and Tony have been flirting all night. At that instant, Tony Dental removed her hand from where it had been resting affectionately atop Rafik's forearm. Don't be a child, Stanley, he said. Then with obvious defiance, placed Tony de Natal's hand back onto his forearm and patted it there securely. But that didn't bother me half as much as hearing him use my nickname so callously in front of the others. He knew it would provoke me. For some reason, reason Rafik was purposely trying to hurt me. Nicole had been wrong about that. But it was neither the time nor the place to press him for his reasons, so I let it go for the moment. I did ask Ricky Rico for more wine, though, and I made a point of grasping his arm and holding it tenderly when I made the request, and then again when he refilled my glass. Two could play at Rafik's game. The brief and tension-ridden exchange between us had caused various reactions around the table. Marshal Xander seemed inordinately pleased by it, as though a minor squabble increased my availability to him. Max Harkley seemed bored by it, as though homosexual misunderstandings were a, a tedious, if necessary, part of the dance world. Scott Malloy was intrigued by her male-to-male tiff in a vicarious sort of way, while Elisa Cortland studied Scott Malloy's interest with a keen, judgmental eye. Tony Di Natal seemed amused by the whole episode, and Madame Rabinskaya remained above it all, impervious, unnoticed, as though an awkward moment like ours never really occurred in polite society. Dinner continued in an atmosphere of congeniality, however forced or mistrustful. When at last we'd finished and were sitting nearly comatose around the big table, Rico once again appeared at the perfect moment and cleared the plates noiselessly. Max Harkey said, Before we take dessert in the salon, I have some announcement about the spring program. His voice assumed a pontifical tone as he continued, As you all know, or at least most of you do, here he eyed me politely, I have just returned from London and I am delighted to bring good news. 
The relief in the air was palpable, as though some imminent disaster had been averted, and everyone could once again breathe normally. Just then, Rico entered the room. His face, usually playful and animated, now showed concern. He leaned toward Max Harkley and whispered into his ear. The result was Max Harkey then excused himself to accept a telephone call in another part of the penthouse. With him gone, a strange, constricting pressure also left the room. Sheesh! said Scott Malloy when he mentioned the spring program. I thought sure the axe was going to fall. What do you mean, said Elisa Cortland. I heard he wants to cancel our new piece with Rafik. Elisa Cortland began. Not Umojio. Please, interrupted Rafik. Do not talk about my work here. He shot a quick, irritated glance at me. Then he asked Scott Malloy, Did Mr. Harkey say something I do not know? Scott said, I've seen his reaction during our rehearsals. I don't think he approves of your theme. At this moment, Marshal Xander tried unsuccessfully to sm stifle a laugh. Scott Malloy scowled back at him and continued, I think Mr. Harkey might be conservative about those things. Marshal Xander then burst into laughter that continued until he lost his breath and began to cough. Then he lapsed into a series of gurgling and wheezing and gulping noises. When he finally recovered himself, he took a big drink of the fine red wine and said to Scott Malloy, You're too much, kid. Too much. Then he shook his head in disbelief as the young dancer's last remarks. Rafik continued the original conversation as though it hadn't been interrupted by a near medical emergency. I think Mr. Harkey would tell me if he changed his mind. Don't be so sure, replied Elisa Cortland. He's been known to change a program on opening night. Anything is possible with him. And his moods, as if to prove her remark, she pouted like a child who had been denied an ice cream. Madame Rebinskaya spoke sharply. It's enough now, all of you. If you cannot say to his face, don't say it all. Marshal Zandel retorted with a wine-swollen tongue. The Gestapo has spoken. Madame Rubinskaya glared angrily back at him. I thought Marshal Xander might stick out his tongue at the old woman, but he didn't. Tony Di Natal said, I think it's peculiar the way you all treat him like a daddy. Her high Brit was really flying now. Then as soon as he's gone, you all go at him like a room full of naughty children. Except for me, I thought dizzily. I asked Rico for just one more glass of wine. Rafi gave me a tiny shake of his head, a discreet warning for me to stop drinking. I raised my empty glass toward him as though making a toast. A toast to our mutual defiance. Tony Di Natale continued. From my experience with him, Max is perfectly approachable. All our interactions have been honest, straightforward, and adult. Well then, said Elisa Cortman, still imitating Tony Di Natale's affected speech. You've obviously gone beyond the daddy stage with him. What? said a startled Tony. Elisa replied. I see the way he looks at you and you at him. My dear, our relationship is strictly professional. Then it's just a question of who's pain, isn't it? said Elisa. Tony Di Natal replied airily. Why, well, Elisa, I believe you're jealous. Should I be? Tony Di Natal giggled. You silly girl! There's not a thing between Max and me, Madame Rubinskaya said. Stop! It's shame to talk like this. Shame on the bloody lot of you, I said, and guzzled my drink. Riffy said, no more for you. I blew him a kiss. Tony D. Natal said, just for your information, Elisa, I'm engaged to Jason Sears. Then why are you flirting with my lover, I demanded. Tony D. Natal tossed her red hair and replied blithely, because Rafik is so adorable and because it's fun. No harm, Stanny. I replied flatly. My name is Stan. Madame Levinskaya shook her head in disdain. When Max Harkey returned to the table, his face was ashen. He sat down and stared into space for a few worried moments before speaking. The telephone call had obviously disturbed him, and everyone at the table attended him as they would the Delphic Oracle. As I was saying before that unfortunate interruption, I had some good news to relate to you all. While I was in London, I managed to engage the Asaluta of choice for our spring program. Max Hartley looked directly at Madame Rebinskaya at the other end of the long table. He went on. Marilee Rebinskaya, Madame's own grandniece, was to join us in the 
title role for our revival of The Phoenix. Madame Rubinskaya's warm smile lapsed quickly into a confused frown. What you mean, was to, Maxie? Max Harkley replied, I'm afraid that's the bad news. That telephone call was long distance from London. Our dear Marielle was injured during rehearsal this afternoon. Bosh! said Madame. How this happened? Max Harkley shook his head with profound regret. Her partner, he began, then had to compose himself before continuing. It seems she made a bad preparation for a lift, and, well, he just couldn't get her up. She landed directly on her knee. I saw Rafik shiver in empathic pain for the dancer and her injury. Madame Rabinskaya said, I will call her now. You can't, said Max Harkey. It's too late. Too late, she said with increasing alarm. I mean the time, he replied. Why, she countered. They call you? It's five hours later in London, Mary Lee. Is resting quietly now. They wouldn't. They waited until after the surgery to call so they'd have a full report. You can call Mary Lee tomorrow. How it can happen, said Madame Rabinskaya. Max Harkey answered sadly. It just happened, you know that, Madame replied. New ballet is not good. Too fast, Rafik asked Mary Harkey. Will she dance again? He answered solemnly. It doesn't look good. She's probably got to stop for four months at least. One thing is hopeful, though. The ligaments are all intact. Then he added as if talking to himself. Thank God she didn't hurt. Then he checked himself. Anything else? So much for the revival of the Phoenix, said Marshal Xander. Tony Di Natale added, I suppose it saves me rehearsing a new score. Maybe I can have some fun instead. Callous bitch, said Elisa Cortland. Come off it, Elisa, said Tony Di Natale. You don't even know the girl. It's still bad luck with another dancer is injured, no matter who it is, said Elisa. I'm glad to see your concern, Elisa, said Max Harkey, because I intend to go on with the performance exactly as planned. Except you will dance the lead. What? said Elisa Cortland in astonishment. Max Harkey stared directly across the long table at Madame Rabinskaya. Then, keeping his eyes on the old woman, he nodded and said, Yes, Elisa, you will dance the phoenix. Madame Rabinskaya uttered a horrified, No, it cannot be. Everyone at the table turned toward her. But it can, said Max Harkey. You know, Maxie, you know very well that role is for Morel. Alone, it cannot be for other ballerina. You know the contract. It says for Morel alone, and you promise. I regret the news of her injury more than any of you can imagine. It is a personal blow to me. Oh, Max, said Marshal Xander. It's her damned knee, not yours. Max Harkley replied, I'm afraid there is much more to this matter than Morel's knee. Nonetheless, the program will proceed as scheduled. The Phoenix will go on. You cannot do that, Max, said Madame Rabinskaya gravely. But I can, he replied. You know, you promise, she said. I know that the promise was not unconditional. The circumstances have changed, so the original agreement no longer holds. How? How? The old woman was almost screeching. Max Harkey spoke to up to her with the calm surety of a son who has control of his mother. Please, Ekaterina, not here. Madame Rebinskaya and Max Harkey fixed their gaze on each other. They said nothing. The showdown lasted twenty excruciating seconds. Then Madame pushed herself away from the table and stood up. You please will excuse me, she said quietly. All of you, I am very tired now. She walked away from the table and left the apartment directly, not even getting her coat. With superb diplomacy, as though Madame Rebinskaya had left to use the lavatory, Max Harkey said to the remaining guest, Shall we retire to the salon for dessert? As we got up from our seats and headed for the salon, where this travesty of etiquette was apparently to continue, I leaned forward toward Elisa Cortland and muttered, It's just like the red shoes. A ballerina goes down, but the show goes on. You're horrible, she said, and walked away arm in arm with Scott Malloy. The numerous martinis and glasses of wine I'd been imbibing all night had finally taken their toll on my social graces and on my kidneys as well. So before going to the salon with the rest of the guests, I wandered through Max Harkey's expensive apartment looking for a bathroom. I found one midway down a long hallway quite far from the rest of the guests. Just as I was about to relieve myself, I heard two people arguing loudly. It was Max Harkley and Marshall Xander. 
Their voices were coming from the open window of a nearby room that faced the same air shaft as the laboratory. With utter concentration, I retightened my sphincter to avert the noisy splash. Tipsy as I was, I wanted to eavesdrop on the two men, and I nipped the gush of my water just in time. Marshal Xander was threatening to withdraw his support from the ballet company if Max decided to cancel Rafik's new work, a piece called Omo Giacoso. So that was its name. Max was arguing that he was in charge of the art and Marshall the money and that Marshall should mind his own business. Marshall demanded to know what Max had against Rafik. Max answered, When he yields to me unconditionally, Rafik can have whatever he wants. You love him then, said Marshall Xander with a pathetic whine. Don't be absurd, Marshall. Rafik needs to be humbled. I wondered for a horrified moment if that was true. Was I supposed to be dominating Rafik? So you've appointed yourself the task, said Marshal Xander. You are certainly the best at putting people down. Will you ever recover from my rejection of you, Marshal? That I consciously chose, in spite of your splendid sexual passivity and your ever-engorging trust fund, the youth and beauty of my girls over the intelligence and dedication you offered me? You more than anyone should know that any that my sexual preference is normal. It must infuriate you to see Rafik like that with his blood and a constant simmer. Just how you like them, and then find him involved with a hairdresser, no less. Ha! Then I heard a sudden loud crash, something large being thrown against a wall and shattered. The noise startled me and caused me to relax. Just tiniest erg! Just enough to let go of that little muscle that was holding back the white water rapids, and then out it all came at once, cascading noisily into the hopper. When I finished, the two men were silent. Were they waiting for me to flush? Was one of them injured? Unconscious? Dead? I remained motionless for another moment. Finally, Max Harkey spoke. That vase was worth a month's salary, Marshal. Then put it on your expense account, Max along with your whores and the wardrobes you supply them. That's enough. You're boring me. We'll see how bored you are at the next trustees meeting. Don't threaten me, Marshal. The company is endowed now, thanks to you. You should have done such a good job. We'll discuss this later, Max. As you wish, our guests are waiting. I saw the light in their room go out. So I flushed the toilet, then rinsed my hands and returned to the so-called party. When I got back to the main salon, everyone was already seated within the rough semicircle described by the expensive furniture. On the long sofa sat Marshal Xander alone, flanking the sofa with two overstuffed easy chairs, one occupied by Max Harkey and the other by Rafik, with Tony Di Natal settled cozily on the matching ottoman next to his legs. Opposite that arrangement, Scott Malloy and Elisa Cortland occupied a love sleep together. The only seats available were various odd side chairs, none of which looked too comfy, and I was feeling like I needed a lot of comfort at that moment. But short of asking Tony Dinital to move and let me sit by my lover, or else sharing the sofa with Marshal Xander, I had no choice but to take one of those hard, straight-backed side chairs. Rico had wheeled in a small serving cart laden with assorted desserts, a silver bowl full of chocolate mousse, an open-faced apple tart with warm caramel sauce, fresh apricots, grapes, pears, and kiwis. And finally, two cheeses. The cart also carried hot beverages and after-dinner liqueurs. If the Boston City Ballet ever had to close its doors, it was clear that Max Harkey, or rather his houseboy Rico, could easily manage a fine restaurant. Rafik was talking to Max Harkey. Is it possible Madame will stop the Phoenix on this program? She'll come around to my way of thinking, replied Max Harkey. Don't worry about that. I don't, said Rafik. I worry about my own work on the program. Max Harkey raised an eyebrow. We'll see, he said. Rafik continued. I need Elisa in my piece, and it is too much for her to do both roles in the same program. Max Harkey set his jaw firmly. I said, we'll see. Marshal Xander said, 
It seems to be a simple choice of reviving something old or showing something new. And you know where my allegiance lies, Max. Yes, I do, replied the older man. Marshal Xander continued, Showcasing new work is the main reason I continue to support this company. That's enough, Marshal. You shut the old woman up. And now you're shutting me up. Who's next? The board of directors? Perhaps you should go home, Marshal. You seem tired. But I haven't had my dessert yet, Max. You're not going to withhold your fine hospitality, are you? Now, after all I've done for you and the company. Is this bickering necessary? Asked Tony Di Natale. Can we discuss the program without personal conflict? Scott Malloy said, But it is all personal, so how can you avoid it? Elisa Cortland added as though the intervening remarks had never been made. I think I could do both roles on the same program. It would be no different from doing Odette and Odell. Rafik answered quickly, No, they are too strenuous. One role will suffer because of the other. Max Harkey added, Besides, my dear Elisa, you are not nearly ready to perform the two swans. And I'll never get there if you keep limiting me. Elisa, I told you, you will be performing the phoenix. And the limitations there is certainly not in the role. Elisa Cortland reddened and said nothing more. Meanwhile, I was wondering what had happened to propriety. First, the artistic director and the chief benefactor of the ballet company were arguing publicly about some very private matters, and their candor was contagious, so now the dancers were chiming in with candid, if feckless, opinions. I figured, why not add my own noise to the fracas? Which piece will attract a bigger audience? I blurted. All faces turned to me in astonishment. Marshal Xander said, Now there's a consideration. The audience. I turned to Rafik. Not that your work is an excellent love, but if you can have only one of these ballets on the program, should you consider audience appeal? Tony Di Natal shifted slightly away from Rafik as though sensing his growing anger. Rafik glowered at me. My work is not practical or political, it is personal. If you knew about my work, you would not say these things. But I don't know about it, do I? And I, well, whose fault is that? You kept it all a big secret for me so far, so what am I supposed to think? You should keep quiet when you don't know, said Rafik. Scott Malloy added, Rafik is right, you don't know what you're talking about. But why is it such a secret for me? Rafik answered. Sometimes a work of art must grow in a private place, away from the eyes of others. So now I'm just others, I said. You make it sound so damn mystical, Rafik, when it's probably nothing more than self-glory. Highbrow art is usually just vanity anyway. God, what was I saying? I knew how hard Rafik worked on his choreography. I only wanted to tell him that I loved him, but instead I was making harsh and critical remarks about his art, perhaps about his life. Rafik replied, Vanity is what you do in a beauty salon. At least I focus my creative energy on another person, not on myself. And why, said Rafik, why, for a bigger tip, there is vanity. God, I was drunk. How could I be so drunk and be thinking and behaving so abominably, yet still have the capacity to realize that I was drunk? I bit my lip, finding back tears of frustration. Here I was, among intelligent, creative people, and with my lover, and I was being a bore. I was utterly unable to assume the mask appropriate. There was only one thing to do, escape from this self-imposed misery. Have another drink. I got up from the disciplinarian chair and asked Rico to pour me a double shot of the strongest liquor. I toasted the group at large. Here's to art and two tips. I gulped the syrupy liquor all at once. Then I excused myself and left the party. Rafik did nothing. He didn't say anything. He didn't get up. He didn't try to stop me. It was Tony Di Natale, of all people, who helped me out. Let me call you a cab, she said. Better to walk when I'm like this, I mumbled back. Burn some of it off. Just get me out of here. On the way out, I once again noticed the gigantic shape of Max Harkey's grand piano, now quite blurry. A musical score, almost the size of a newspaper folio, and with a colorful cover was lying flat on the musical stand. What was that? I asked her. The score to the Phoenix, she said, then added somberly. It's the music that started the whole argument.
Then to my surprise, she hugged me. I figured it was a holdover from her Italian upbringing. She murmured into my inebriated ear. You are lucky to have Rafik, her words in her warm breath, caused my ear to burn. He is a very sexy man. I felt a tingling around my nipples, that sure sign of strong emotion. Everyone else seems to think so too, I said. Rico arrived with my coat. He gave me a big friendly smile, but I was too drunk and too self-absorbed to appreciate it. Outside on the street, the sight of Big Red almost caused me to burst into tears. But I bit the inside of my lip and pinched the bridge of my nose to keep the tears at bay. I wasn't about to be seen stumbling home with hot tears streaming down my cheeks, looking like any other jilted queen. When I got home, I found myself bewildered by what had just happened. I had somehow killed my dream of love. How had it happened? What demons lurked within me to accomplish such a thing? I stumbled into bed, and then remembering that this was to be my anniversary night with my lover, I finally broke down and sobbed and wailed into my pillow. Even Sugar Baby did not join me that night. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold. To offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew. Reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.